I'll title this Covenant, I think. That'll work. Go with me, please, to Psalm 89. Psalm 89. We're going to see here this psalm is uh, speaking of promises given to David. And in verse 1, <clears throat> it says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. You guys know that's a chorus too? I don't know if we sing very often, but it is. Okay. Uh, with my mouth I will make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne. To all generations, Salah. Salah means pause and calmly think of that if you're reading an amplified version. And so you just see about the mercies of the Lord. God made David, King David, promises that through his descendants would come Jesus Christ and, and that his throne would stand forever on this earth. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And the Lord made, a, made this a covenant. Now when you think of this word covenant, a covenant is, is an agreement, it's a promise. It's also, interestingly enough, and I'd forgotten about this, when we speak about um, the New Testament and the Old Testament, that word testament is the same word as covenant. If you're looking up in your Strong's Concordance, you'll see Testament and covenant, exactly the same word. And, and so a testament is also like a will, which is a, like an agreement, a covenant, that when the person dies, whatever they decide in the will will pass on to their descendants, that will be done. It's an agreement, it's signed, and, and it's legal. And it's like when Jesus, when he shed his blood for us, he was entering into a covenant before the Father, for the Holy Ghost, Himself, and for anyone who will believe and obey His Word. That, that's a covenant. And so, God said these words to David, a covenant. Now we have to stop and, and consider you, the day you repented of your sin, and decided, okay Lord, I, I will get baptized, and I'll bury my sin underneath the waters of baptism. And I'll call upon you, Jesus, to fill me with your Spirit. He fills us with the Spirit. We spoke in tongues. We experienced all the power and the blessing of the Lord. Changing our life, forgiving us of sin, and giving us eternal life, making us sons and daughters of God. How amazing that is, old people said. Mm -hmm. You entered into a covenant. Just as a, as a man and a woman, when they get married, they enter into, into a covenant. The Lord enters into a covenant with us. And, uh, and, and so we have to value this covenant. It's like every day we are, we are sons and daughters of a covenant. We have promised the Lord. When we sat in those waters and we confessed, Jesus, you are Lord. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died, rose again, sent into the heavens to pour out the Holy Spirit. I'm living my life according to this belief, according to this truth. I will stand for you, Lord. It's like we've signed our name on the covenant. And I'm, I'm going to follow you, Jesus. And I'm going to walk in the power of your spirit. Yes, there's times where, where, um, where, 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 where we might wander from the path. And the Lord comes and he brings us back on. And, and we walk on. We, we realize, oh, okay, yes, covenant. I'm going on. God had great mercy on David to make this covenant with him and to continue to bless David's life though he did some pretty horrible things the Lord forgave him and honored the covenant so we're reading here about this covenant your seed I will establish forever and build 
uh, upon thy throne to all generations. We are a part of that that seed now because through Jesus Christ we we come under His lordship, under His rule, under His authority, under His covenant. Go to two kings. I'm going to read here about a king who was a descendant of David, but sadly he did not realize the covenant. 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 1. Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. And Ahaziah, this is the king, King Ahaziah, fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire of Belzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. Doot, 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 doot. Warning sign. Warning sign. Something's wrong here. Right? Bell's going off. Woo, siren's going. Wait a minute. Something's wrong. Here's a king of Israel. He falls down, has an accident. He's injured. It ends up bringing a sickness. So he's thinking, I might die here. And, and he sends messengers to go inquire of, a, of an idol, of a false god. And doesn't bat an eye. Doesn't think anything's wrong with that. This is a king. I mean, a king should know better, right? Should. But uh, just because someone is in a position of authority doesn't mean they have wisdom. Even our bosses at work. And uh, praise the Lord. Uh, I was talking to Anthony and he was telling me about he was preaching the gospel to his boss at work and his boss didn't like it but he kept standing for the Lord and it was cool. And so king not making a wise choice verse 3 and again the king not valuing the covenant that he should have had before God to honor God as king to honor the, the covenant that God made with David to be a king over Israel. Verse 3. But the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah the Tishbite, this is the prophet, prophet of God, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a god in Israel that you go to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? This is God sending his prophet, and apparently it's quite a distance to Ekron, I suppose. And here, here these messengers are, okay, they're, they're walking along, message from the king, going to inquire of this false god. But in their eyes, it isn't a false god. In their eyes, he really is a god, but he isn't. Verse 4. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord, thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, Thou shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. Oops. <laughs> Those were very good words. And, and when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, Why are you now turned back? The, the king realized, Wait a minute, you're, you're back way too quick here. You didn't go to Ekron. Verse 6. He said unto him, There came up a man... There came a man up to meet us and said unto us, Go turn again unto the king that sent you, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. So the messengers obviously thought this was a serious word. They didn't ignore it and say, oh, who are you? You're, you're nobody. We're, we're, we're on our way to Ekron with a word and a request of the king. They realized, oh, okay, Elijah is serious. And they turned back. <clears throat> Verse 7, he said unto them, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you? Okay, and told you these words. And they answered him, He was a hairy man, 
and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. He knew this was God's prophet, the king. Then said the king unto him, uh, Oh, and you go on and, and, and he sends a captain of a captain with 50 of his men to, to go to Elijah to, to command him to come down. And, and Elijah calls down fire from heaven. It's quite a story when you read on. But the main point I wanted to bring out here is that here's a king. And I'm not totally sure on his descendants from David. I'll have to check that. But still he's a king. And he should be honoring God. He should be honoring a covenant. And he had no idea about the Lord. He was completely disregarding the prophet of God, Elijah, and, and didn't care, didn't think twice about it. Now let's think of ourselves. Here we are, sons and daughters of God, children of a covenant, children in a position of authority. You have to realize the authority you have. Even if you're the youngest one in this room, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you have great authority. You have authority to preach the Word of God. You have authority to lay hands on people and, and see situations change. You have authority to, to shine in this world as a son, daughter of God, so that people will see your testimony and see you're a person of a covenant. You've made an agreement with a God, the God, the only God, the God of this book. You've made a covenant to stand for Him, regardless of what's taking place around us. We stand. And we're not like this Ahaziah, a king in authority who commands messengers to do this and do that, probably had great wealth as a king, but completely stupid, completely lacking wisdom, with all of his authority and position and pomp and pageantry as, as a king, he knew nothing. And, and so we have to rise up to our calling, rise up to this position of authority that we have, and realize, I, I have made a covenant with my king. My king made a covenant with me, Jesus, in his blood. He signed it with his blood on the cross so that He could place His life inside of us and rescue us from the lost state that we were in and make us His sons and daughters, children of a covenant. Now, um, there's something at camp that I didn't share that I want to share. It was, it, was, it was the most, probably one of the most special things I witnessed at camp, at Youngie's camp. And... We were, at, uh, we, were, we were at our bonding time, and Nathan was asking us to, uh, to say just things that we were going through and, and sort of trials that we were going through, something that might stand out. And we went around the circle, different people said things. And, uh, and our brother Alessandro mentioned that he was, he was just feeling upset about brothers in the Lord his age that had left, close to his age. And, and you could see it really upset him, because... Because it is upsetting when a brother and sister leaves. And um, when, they, when they don't value the covenant. You can see they don't value it. You can see by the way they live their life. And, and you can see that Alessandro is almost near tears thinking about it. But now stop and consider. Why, why did he have that kind of a feeling within him? In case you're wondering, I did clear this with them. They said it was okay for me to talk about it. And... Um, The reason why he felt so emotional was because he values the covenant that he made with Jesus Christ. The day he repented and was baptized and filled with the Spirit. And he's living his life by that covenant. And he wants to continue following the Lord, even if people that are close to us leave. And um, so we, we, went, we went around the circle and that was done. We moved to something else in the bonding time and... And afterwards, I noticed that Alice was chatting to Al Alessandro, and I, in my mind, I thought she's probably encouraging him. And, and then I looked and I saw, oh, they're talking to Pastor Kevin. And I thought, oh, he's probably encouraging him too. Oh, that's good. 
And I was thinking to myself, oh, I hope I get a chance to talk, talk to him. That'd be good. And um, so I got ready for bed, started to get ready for bed. While I'm on my way to the shower, carrying all my gear. And, and uh, I, Andy was walking with me. Got to the shop, got close to the shower, and, and Alessandro and his sis, sister Elizabeth are sitting on the wall, facing each other. And you can see they were both having a serious conversation, but and they they were upset too, because you could see they were crying. And I just walked by. Is everything okay? And I I I knew I had a pretty good idea what they were talking about. And um, but in the conversation. Elizabeth was encouraging Alessandro. And Elizabeth is a quiet person, and I haven't heard her say a, whole, a, a lot. I've talked to her some, and, and that, she's awesome and wonderful. I'm kind of a quiet person too, so I know what that's like. And, but that's okay. But the words that were coming out of her mouth were beautiful. They were like words of covenant. They were words of Alessandro. You, if you need help, you come and you knock on my door and I'll pray with you. And mom cares about you and will pray. And she was saying, and these people care about you too. Speaking of me, oversight, saints, because Andy was there too. And, and she was saying, they'll pray with you as, you, you as well. She's got tears in her eyes and he had tears and I was feeling tears. <laughs> and, um, but it was so powerful because because it showed me where Elizabeth's vision was. And I didn't know that. I didn't know that's where she was. And, and it showed me how her attitude for the Lord and to encourage her brother and to care for her brother was all covenant. It was all just right on and good. And I, there really wasn't much I could say. Listen to her. <laughs> what she said is a good word. That is good wisdom. We prayed and I did say some things. And, and, um, but it was one of the most powerful things that I experienced at, at, at Young East Camp. As well as the whole thing was a really great time. But I'm reminding, let's remind ourselves of this covenant that we have. You're going to face a time where where it's going to be you in front of someone like Elizabeth was in front of her brother. And you're going to be the one that's realizing, I've got to encourage this person about the covenant that we stand for. And I'm going to. And you're going to step into that position and speak. Because the Lord's going to use you to reach people that no one else can, can reach. And a lot of times, especially with young people too, when it's a young person speaking to a young person, sort of youngy to youngy, do to do, do this to do this. I don't know, know, know what the ladies say. <laughs> and, uh, but it's there's a there's a very special power there when a young person can speak to a young person and encourage them in the covenant. Because, yeah, so we're, we're older and we've got the gray hair. And, but when a young person who is young and valuing the things of God, that's powerful. And that makes a big impact on the person you're speak to, speaking to. Whether it's a brother or sister in the Lord or you're at your school, your work, wherever. You speaking on their level is like, whoa. It makes a big impact. So let's go to Isaiah 55. Read that story of, of Ahaziah and 2 Kings 1. It's quite a powerful one. Isaiah 55. I just wanted to bring out this covenant idea. Um, down in verse 3. Incline your ear and come unto me here, and your seed shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and a commander to the people. Again, this, this idea of King David, the sure mercies that, that God had given him, sure mercies are, are sure. God will be there with us. Surely he is there. His mercy will be 
will be powerful and strong and he, he promises to stand by us if we honor the covenant. You have made a covenant. It's like, I guess it's similar to if you go buy a car and you make a covenant to pay for the payments for that car and you don't keep that covenant, they're coming to get that car. <laughs> right? Someone's going to be knocking on your door and they're going to tow that car away. But this is a far more powerful covenant. This is a, a relationship. But still, we've got to honor our part. If we honor our part of the covenant, the Lord runs to us and He'll do so much more than we could ever do to honor the covenant. Go to Jeremiah 31. We know that God made a covenant with David as He made a covenant as well with His people Israel. <clears throat> he told His people Israel, you follow me, you let me be your God because I'm the only God. I'll bless you, I'll provide for you and I'll bring you into the prom promised land and, and you'll be blessed. Israel didn't honor that covenant and many, many of them turned their back on the covenant. And so in Isaiah 31 verse 31, God, through Jeremiah the prophet, said to Israel, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. They were split in two. Israel was the house of Israel to the north and Judah to the south. That's why he, he speaks of them like this. <clears throat> Verse 32, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. So God's relating the covenant he made to Israel like a covenant that a man and a woman will make on earth. <clears throat> and he's saying, I was a husband to you, Israel, but you turned your back on me. Verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. They will be uh, and will be their God and they shall be my people. And this is what the Lord has done for each of us. This covenant has been fulfilled in our lives where the Lord has written His law, His word, His plan, His covenant on our hearts, in our spirit that has now been born again by the Holy Spirit. And we're made sons and daughters. A new covenant. In the Old Testament, we read Moses brings them out of Egypt, brings them into the, into the desert. There's the... The Ten Commandments on, on the stone plus the 600 laws of, of the Old Testament with sacrifice and the tabernacle and the temple and everything. All that through Jesus Christ has been fulfilled and a new covenant has been made. And it's, it's us, filled with the Holy Ghost. His, his Word in our heart. This is why His Word is on our mind so much. Because it's in our heart. By the Holy Spirit. He wrote it there somehow. With... God pen. <laughs> and um, miraculously, by His Spirit, in our heart, is His ways. Matthew 26. Go there. <clears throat> so Jesus, the night when He was about to uh, be arrested, He gathered with His disciples. Verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. We are about to partake of this very soon. <clears throat> this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to all them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament. Remember, New Testament is also covenant. You can read the exact same word. The New Testament. Which is shed for many for the remission of my sins. For I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. In His blood is this covenant made. 
And we have to remind ourselves when we're challenged, when we're challenged to leave the Lord, when we're challenged to not trust Him, when we're challenged in any way, we have to remember, I made a covenant with Jesus Christ. He made a covenant with me in His blood to provide for me right now through this situation, through this trial. The Lord will, will, will be there for us, but we must stand. We must drink of this covenant, drink of His blood by trusting His sacrifice, trusting what He's done by filling us with the Holy Spirit, drinking in the kingdom of God with the Lord. We have tasted of the kingdom of God the day He filled us with His Spirit. And there's so much more to come as, as we wait for the return of the Lord. And so when you read this verse about drinking of the fruit of the vine, he talks about drinking it new in my Father's king, king, kingdom. There's sort of partial fulfillments there. We've, we've tasted of this kingdom now. It's wonderful. It, it's what motivates us to be here today. It, 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 what, it's what motivates us to pray, to read His Word, to speak about His Word, to praise Him, to sing to the Lord. It's all this covenant. It's all this revelation of, of His kingdom. He's, he's shown us now, though we see through a glass darkly, we don't see the full picture, but He's coming. There's so much more of the kingdom to come. Praise the Lord. Go to Acts 13. In Acts chapter 13, Paul is pre preaching. Of course, this is after Jesus has ascended to the heavens. He's poured out the Holy Spirit on those who obey His word. <clears throat> and... So in verse 22 of Acts 13. And when he had removed him, so this is in the, middle of, in the middle of Paul's preaching. When he had removed him, speaking of removing King Saul from being a king over Israel, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom he also gave testimony or gave covenant and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Every time I read this, I think, Lord, I just want to be like that. I want to be a man after your heart. I don't want to be after the heart of this world, because the heart of this world is empty. The heart of this world can't provide anything, can't bring joy, can't bring peace, can't bring eternal life, can't bring forgiveness of sins. The world's empty. Verse 23. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. So he goes on to say, skip down to verse 30. But God raised him from the dead, and he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, or the gospel, glad tidings, good news. How that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten you. So he's preaching Jesus. He's just like preaching the gospel to him. Skip down to verse um, 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified or declared righteous from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware therefore lest there come upon, upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold you despisers and wonder and perish for I work a work in your days a work which you shall in no wise believe though a man declare it unto you. <clears throat> and so here we are declaring Jesus Christ. We're declaring the covenant. 
You know what? I missed, I, I meant to read verse 34. Just skip over to there, please. Verse 34. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Speaking of Jesus Christ, Jesus has come to give us the sure mercies of David, the covenant. Remember in Isaiah 55, we read about the sure mercies of David. Paul in his preaching is bringing that verse into his preaching here, saying Jesus is alive. He's been given the sure mercies of David. He's been given the covenant. He is the descendant David promised that will rule over this world forever. Believe in him, follow him, enter into the covenant, come and seek him. And, and so this is what we do. We go out and we preach the same gospel, the same covenant, with the same passion that Alessandro and Elizabeth had that night on the wall. Same passion, passion of, you've got to follow the Lord. You've got to seek Him. Sometimes it, it feels like we can, it, it can bring tears to our eyes as we're preaching to someone, as we preach the reality of, of the gospel and the truth. Jesus is alive. He wants to come in you. He wants to change your life. And we can see the, the hurt and pain the people are in. And, and here we are, little old us. We've got an answer. But it's not little old us. We're far more than that. We're sons and daughters of God with authority to speak His Word. With the sure mercies of David at our side, the covenant God made with David, we've entered into. We can't be like an Ahaziah who's going through a problem. Oh, I'm sick. I'm not feeling well. Oh, I've got to consult the God of Ekron. I've got to consult my best friend in the world who isn't following the Lord. Perhaps that's not a very good best friend. Maybe you need a best friend who's in the Lord and who's following the Lord. And, and then the kind of advice you would get would be, follow the Lord. Seek the Word of God. Don't give up on the Lord. We can't be like an Ahaziah. He did not value the covenant for all the possessions he had, sadly. So let's go to Acts chapter 2, and we'll close off there. If you're new here today, and you have not received the Holy Spirit, Jesus is here. There's a covenant. You have to make a choice. And it's a choice that every single one of us in this room faced. We had to decide, okay, what am I going to do? Am I just going to live my life for me? Or am I going to enter into a covenant with one who shed his blood to ratify this covenant, Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 2, verse 4, it says, They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were waiting for the Holy Ghost. They were praying. Holy Ghost comes, comes down, comes in them. They began to speak in tongues. This is how they were filled with the Spirit. Peter stands up, he preaches Jesus, just like we read in Acts 13 about Paul preaching Jesus. He tells him he's risen, he's alive, you've got to repent, you've got to follow the Lord. Skip over to verse 37. You know what, let me read verse 36 first. Therefore let all the house of Israel, we could also say let, all, let the whole world know, everyone around me know, assuredly, that God has made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. He's the man. He's the one. He's the Messiah who has brought the covenant. Verse 37. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They realized they just killed the Messiah. And they were feeling bad. What should we do? Is there, is there any hope for us? Type of, type, of, type of thing. Verse 38. Peter said unto them, Repent. Change your life. Turn around. Turn to this Lord and Christ Jesus. Come to Him. 
Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. We have a baptism tank behind these curtains. You can be baptized today. You can bury your life of sin underneath the waters of baptism. And he says, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. How do we receive it? The same way they just received. You will speak in tongues at that instant. The Lord will come and, and fill your body and make your body the temple of the Holy Ghost. Verse 39, For the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. With many other words he did testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. This world is in wickedness. We must save ourselves. We must enter into a covenant with Jesus Christ. If you've not done this, today's the day. Make that choice. You may not have tomorrow. And we can make it happen. We can help you with, with uh, knowing the gospel and help you repent and be baptized. Pray with you to receive the Spirit. Jesus is here. You must have the Holy Spirit to be born again, to be a Christian. There's, there's no if, ands, or buts about it. This is what... Jesus said, he said, you must be born again of water and of the Spirit. It's not an option. And so if you want to enter into this covenant, you must have the Holy Ghost. And we want to do all we can to help you be filled with the Spirit. So if you, would, if you want to be baptized or pray to receive the Spirit, decide today, enter into that covenant, all the people said. Amen. Let's value that covenant. All right, we'll leave the speaking there.